Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Right Honourable Lady is absolutely right to thank the clerk and the staff of this House, who were all absolutely magnificent. I will reiterate what I said before, that every member of my private office volunteered to come in on Saturday, and I think that is simply an example of the commitment to the House of Commons that we see from all our staff. And it is really rather wonderful that so many people who work here appreciate and value the Houses of Parliament and have the historic understanding of what a privilege it is to be here. Uh, may I add my thanks and joining the Right Honourable Lady to the police for the escorts they provided to get people home, including me. Um, I've had many really very kind inquiries about my son. Uh, he is a 12-year-old boy. He found nothing more exciting than being escorted home by the police. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, sure he should, I'm not sure he should have found it so exciting, but, 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 but he did. But as a, as a really serious point, I think it is very important that honourable and right honourable members can come and go from the precincts of Parliament feeling safe. And we must think about whether there is more we need to do and whether sessional orders may be helpful in that regard. But all honourable and right honourable members are representing 70,000, sometimes more, constituents and must be able to come here and go without any feeling that they are under any pressure from any uh, group outside Parliament. Um, the Right Honourable Lady refers to my point of order on Saturday. Uh, as you all know, there is long-standing precedent uh, for this. One of the examples actually by my late godfather, Norman St. John Stevens, in 1980. A more recent one uh, by the, my Right Honourable friend, uh, the member of Epsom and Ewell, and one only in September by my Right Honourable friend, the Prime Minister. But also, the Right Honourable Lady is, I am sure, aware, as are you, Mr Speaker, of page 408 of Erskine May, that gives the Speaker discretion to turn a substantive point of order into a statement, had he so wished. Mr Speaker did not so wish, and therefore I made two points of order to help the House and to understand what the business would be today, with, of course, the promise of a full statement today, which is exactly what is happening. And there are going to be occasions when business changes in response to votes. That is a perfectly normal <coughs> system within this House. Um, on the um, Queen's speech, yes, of course we will come back to the Queen's speech, but we do have a deadline of the 31st of October, a deadline set in law for dealing with our departure from the European Union, and we need to have the legislation in place by then. Or the alternative is that we leave uh, without a deal. Um, the Right Honourable Lady asked about the bill. Well, I know there is. I'm sorry, speak up. Oh, the Right Honourable Lady asked why I left the chamber. That's extremely straightforward. Matters of points of order are for the chair, they're not for um, the Leader of the House. It would be an impertinence of me to think that I could possibly know more than Mr Speaker about the proceedings and order of this House, and I would not like to give the impression uh, of having knowledge that I could not pretend to have. It is for Mr Speaker to rule on points of order, not for other honourable members. I had made my point of order and listened to several other points of order, but there were no um, further opportunities for me to speak because it was a matter for the chair. Uh, the bill will be published very shortly. Uh, the presentation of bill will be the first item of public business when we come on to the business of the day. And at that point, simultaneously as if by magic, uh, the bill will appear in the vote office for honourable and right honourable members to peruse, and I'm sure they will enjoy that. The programme motion will be down tonight in an orderly way. Well, I hope it will be an orderly way. Mr Speaker will rule on that. If it's not, um, for debate tomorrow. Uh, and the bill, of course, won't be pulled. But the Right Honourable Lady, the Right Honourable Lady is one of the most charming members of this House, has enormous grace and thoughtfulness. But when she said we were running scared of democracy, I think uh, she must have been trying to pull our collective legs, Mr Speaker. It, it is this government that has offered a general election not just once, but twice. I mean, how frightened is that of democracy? We are so terrified of the voters that we want them to have the chance to vote, so scared that we feel that they should be allowed to go to the ballot box. No. If there is any scaredness, if there is any frightenedness, if anybody is fret, Mr Speaker, they are on the opposition benches. Uh, let me endorse what the Leader of the House said in all solemnity about the absolute and precious right of members of this place and of staff to go about their business safely and unimpeded. That has to be 
an absolute and non-negotiable. And where that right has been threatened, that threat is to be unequivocally condemned. And sometimes I fear that people think that one form of hollering or protest is acceptable and another is not. The truth is that no such behaviour, which could be intimidating or threatening or worse, can possibly be justified in our democracy. I note what the leader said more widely about points of order. Points of order are a matter for response by the chair. It was not, nevertheless, an obligation of the leader to beetle out of the chamber during the said points of order, given that most of them were proxies for commentaries upon his own. Nevertheless, I note what he said. There was no disinclination on my part for there to be an emergency business statement. I had rather thought that that was what the leader was going to proffer, and therefore there was just a genuine misunderstanding between us on that point. But I ascribe no ulterior motive to the leader, and I know that he would not to me.